Okay, so we talked a lot in chapter 11 about intermolecular forces and defining those and what effect they had on phase changes, etc. Now we need to take some of that knowledge and apply it to talk about the properties of solutions. Now these don't have to be aqueous solutions, but in many cases they are. And one of the very first things we'll look at when we are looking at solution chemistry is the energetics of actually forming a solution. What are the energies involved in actually taking a substance and dissolving it in some liquid? And so there's actually three intermolecular forces that are involved here. There are the solute-solute interactions that must be overcome. And we can actually think of these as being intramolecular interactions some, sometimes in the case where we're dealing with, I, with an ionic solid, but they don't always have to be uh, intramolecular forces. And we can actually write an expression or an equation for the disruption of the solute-solute interactions. So we can talk about the solute uh, with some subscript N indicating it's all together in one uh, species, and then breaking that apart into N individual solute molecules or ions. And then there is an enthalpy associated with that, which by default, since we're breaking things apart and we're disrupting either ionic bonds or intermolecular forces, that delta H value for the solute must be positive. We also have solvent-solvent interactions that must be overcome. So when you dissolve a solid into a solvent, the solvent was interacting with each other, but now it switches to interact with the solid primarily. And although you still have solvent-solvent interactions, but some of those solvent-solvent interactions are disruptive. So we must break those interactions as well. Those would be intermolecular. And we can write an expression for that as well, similarly to the solute expression and come out with a delta H value for the solvent, which again also must be positive because we are disrupting or breaking intermolecular attractions. And then finally, the last interaction here is that we gain energy from solute-solvent interactions. So now the solute is surrounded by the solvent, and in many cases we have uh, ion-dipole interactions if it is an ionic solid, it's molecular, we might have dipole-dipole interactions that are gained. We can write an expression for this as being the number of solute molecules plus n solvent molecules forms our solution, and this gets us a delta H for mixing the solid and the liquid, or it could be two liquids if the solute is a liquid. Now if we take our knowledge from chapter 5 and apply Hess's law to this expression, to these three uh, constituent reactions, we can actually sum them to get a net reaction for making a solution. And that's taking solute and solvent and adding them together to form our solution. And then the enthalpy for, sol for solution formation is the sum of the enthalpy of mixing plus the enthalpy of the solvent, disrupting the solvent interactions, plus the enthalpy of disrupting the solute. And the net result from all of this is we have two possibilities. We can have a case where delta H for solution is exothermic or negative, or we can have a case where delta H is positive and solution formation is endothermic. Those are our two options. We'll go through both of those. What, what does that look like, especially considering our constituent reactions? Well, let's take a look at the exothermic process first. We were already told that delta H for solvent, breaking the solvent interactions, and that's kind of illustrated here in this cartoon diagram, that must be a positive value because we're disrupting intermolecular attractions. And disrupting the sol, uh, well, no, sorry, this is the solvent. Disrupting the solute is also uh, an, an endothermic process. This must take energy. So the sum of those two is some particular energy here. So then whether or not a reaction is endothermic or exothermic depends on the amount of energy that we gain from the mixing process. In this particular case for an exothermic reaction, we gain more energy from mixing than we were required 
from uh, the, than was required for disrupting the solute interactions and disrupting the solvent interactions. And so the net is that we end up at a lower energy after we've mixed them than what we started out individually. And thus, uh, if delta H of mixing is more negative than the sum of, uh, than the sum of delta H solute and delta H solvent, we end up with a net negative value and uh, we end up with an exothermic reaction. Now, what does this look like? How do we, you know, up to this point, it may seem fairly theoretical. How does this actually uh, make any sense in the real world? Well, this is actually how instant like hot packs work. So what there are essentially in a hot pack is you have some um, container, generally two different containers, uh, one that might have the liquid material and then within that uh, within that solvent there might be another container that's sealed that holds us that holds the solid in this case a uh, solid um, uh, that would be dissolved in that liquid and then you break that solid package in there mix the solid with the liquid and if the um, enthalpy for solution formation is negative then the material gives off heat a uh, common example here is magnesium sulfate being the solid material for these instant hot packs. When you take that and break that inner solid package to get the solid to mix with the water, well, we have, uh, we're disrupting the um, magnesium sulfate solid, uh, so that would be our sol delta H solute. We're disrupting some water interactions, that's delta H solvent, but when we go to form the solvated ions, the enthalpy of mixing is much more negative. And so as a result, we give off actually a negative 91.2 kilojoules per mole of magnesium sulfate. So this is quite exothermic and the hot pack gets quite hot. And then we can use that on sore muscles or any other purpose. So what about endothermic cases, the alternative? So in this case, again, the disrupting of the solvent interactions is still requires energy, the disrupting of the solute interactions, that requires energy. And the sum of those two is a particular value. But in this case, the delta H for mixing, we don't gain as much energy as it required to disrupt the solute and solvent interactions. And so we end up at a net positive value for our enthalpy greater than what we started at. And so the net for solution is greater than zero or positive and so as a result, the entire process requires, is net requiring an energy. And so it sucks that energy in the form of heat from the surroundings. And so the reaction will, or the solution will feel cold. This is the concept behind instant cold packs. Again, very similar. The reaction here that's very common is dissolving ammonium nitrate in water. So again, you would have some solid pack in there that would have ammonium nitrate, and you'd have water, you mix them, and this is endothermic. The net process here requires 26.4 kilojoules. And so you might wonder, well, why is ammonium nitrate even soluble then if this whole process is net endothermic? Well, it is, but it's, uh, it's not such an insanely large endothermic value that they won't mix at all. What we have here is this simply it will suck that energy that's required from the surroundings and thus the hot the pack gets cold and you can put it on sores or something of that nature. So this is just a brief intro into the basic energetics for solution formation and where the various um, where the various energies come in because mixing or dissolving materials in solution to, in, in a solvent to make a solution is always going to be a net endothermic or exothermic process, even if the net value is relatively small.